Good, good morning, excuse me. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you and that you've taken this time to come out and fellowship together. Like was brought up just a few moments ago, we're looking forward to our Friends Day uh, next Sunday and pray that you'll be there, especially if you're watching online as well. Please come and join us. We would love to have the privilege of, of getting to know you. We're going to have food and fellowship. It's going to be outstanding and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, what I want to kind of do today is kind of zoom out from what we talked about specifically last week in Ephesians 2. And if you've got the handout, I'm strictly going to go by the handout that's in the bulletin today and talk about some of these points. The reason I want to do this today is just over the past couple of weeks, I've had different people either uh, by way of email, talk personally, that have had issues with believing that they are truly saved in Christ. It's not that they're doubting the power of Christ. They feel they've either done so much, so wrong, that they're in a state where, does he, does he, am I really saved? And what I hope this does also, we go through this today, will be a springboard into seeing even that much more why you've got a friend in Jesus from looking at this, this material today. So if you want to follow along on the sheet, Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, and then we're going to practice uh, some talking about what we're reading. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So let's kind of, what I want us to practice today, this is why I, what I call zooming out. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, where they're being commanded on how they need to cherish the law, the words of God right in the law with their family, with their children, and how they're really to kind of saturate their children with the law. You know, it should be on them from the time they get up in the morning, you know, to the end of the day, right? Inundated almost with it. But in Deuteronomy 6, 7, there's a very important thing I think we need to do more of together. We're already doing it. Let's just keep practicing and even meeting and talking with people. We can, and I've been guilty of this, book, chapter, and versing somebody to death. I've done that, all right? I've been the kind of person that's almost done a machine gun thing with the Word of God. So many scriptures there. What I wanted to do today is the scriptures that are, are in this outline, I want to talk about them. In Deuteronomy 6, 7, he says he wants the parents to talk, not only quote it, but to talk about it with the children as they go. And so I hope this is helpful today. We're going to look at some of what I believe the greatest treasures that lead to having blessed assurance in Jesus Christ. These things are just amazing to me and all that the Bible shows, and these are but a few. There's many more. So point number one, before coming to Christ, the Ephesians were in a predicament. They were not in a good state at all. But by Jesus doing what he did, by his dying on the cross, he opened this way to God. And what I want you to do is I go over these verses. I'm not going to quote all of them. I'm going to talk about them. I want you to go home and study them for yourself, okay? Read them for yourself. If you get confused in your reading... Zoom out and look at the whole chapter that that verse is in. And then even then, sometimes, depending on if you've got the time to do it at that moment, it's good to zoom out and look at the entire book in which you find the verse, to look at the context. And that's something I've taken in consideration. It's going to tell you that in bringing these verses. So when you go on, please take time. If the only passage or scripture you get is from the preacher on Sunday, you're shortchanged. All right? And I'm a, I'm a man, I'm flawed, right? I'm a servant of Christ with you. So you need to be checking out God's word as I read and study with you as well. In Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it sit, see there is labeled, is that we're these children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Something I think is really neat, when you go back and look at the Koine Greek, the original language, and you look earlier in the letter, in Galatians 2, verses 12 through 21, it's when Paul confronted Peter, the apostle, to the face for showing favoritism to the Jewish Christians over the Gentile ones. And something he keeps emphasizing the importance of is some translations read this, 
faith in Christ Jesus, justification by faith in Christ Jesus. The more I have studied that in the context, it would be better rendered justi justified by the faithfulness of Christ Jesus, what he's done, what he did. This is what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am therefore crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Think about that. That is what we lean on. Yes, it's important to give mental acceptance. Yes, it's important to obey. But the foundation of our salvation is the faithfulness of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, what he's done. Isn't it awesome that it's equitable, what he offers? There's not, well, in order to become a member of this club, you have to have this much money. Well, in order to become a member of this club, you have to be this group of people or that. You have to be in this class. What God offers is equitable. It is for everyone it's offered. One of my favorite verses at the end of the Bible in Revelation 22, 17 is inviting whosoever will come. Drink of the water of life freely. It's not just the church saying it. The Spirit is saying it well through the church. In Acts 1, 8, that's where we read Jesus telling his disciples, fixing to be what we call the apostles. He says, look, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And guess what? You guys are going to be witnesses of me to the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Salvation is not just for one group of people. Jesus, the whole time it's been going that way, it's offered to all. One of the things I think is so neat is how Paul brings this up, that he, you talk about a scholarly Jewish male, knowing his material, he points out that Jesus truly is the Messiah who will rule not over on only Israel, but all nations in Romans chapter 15 and verse 12. That includes the Gentiles. So I want you to think, hold on to that for just a minute. Just what we've looked at now, how many people does God want to be saved? Everyone. He's not going to force it. He freely offers it to all, and there's something implied there. I can accept it or reject it. But, folks, it's the greatest gift you could ever fathom, what God has offered through in and through his son Jesus, and he offers it to all. In Titus 2.11, that section talks about the grace of God. That's what it brings, salvation. And it's appeared not to a select few, but to everyone. Not only, get this, not only to bring salvation, but to show you the life to live even now. The one God designed for you. That's one of the things that grace does. It shows us that in scripture that we're not only saved, but how to live as someone who is saved as well. And Hebrews 2.9 says that Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, made a little lower than the angels. He tasted death for every single individual, everyone. That's you, that's me, that's even those outside the body. He's done that so that they could have the blessing of salvation if they will but accept it. And a verse that always comes to mind, it pictures Jesus as the perfect atoning lamb sacrifice for us, is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. John's reminding the very ones he's writing to is something who are, who are discouraged. If you want to go to a letter where discouraged Christians are questioning, are we okay with God? Am I, is, I guess, are we really doing what, do we know what the truth is? John is writing to them to go, yes, you are the knowing ones, not these over here that are pushing something else. It's you. Now, the first chapter he shows we are going to sin. Who's we? Christians, and guess who's writing? John, the apostle. He includes himself in the category of if we say we have no sin presently, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, here's the thing. We learn from the first chapter, if you want to try to live a life, then to not sin at all, not going to happen. Right? 
Not going to happen. As we're walking the light, the blood has to constantly cleanse. If you're watching this even online today and you've got questions about, well, what about between this prayer and the next prayer if I've done something wrong? I want to live for Jesus. Well, this is why the blood of Christ cleanses us 24-7. 1 John 1, 7 shows that in the present tense. And this is why we need to come to the grips of this. They, oh, one of the most sobering statements one of my favorite teachers made at the school of preaching to all us young and upcoming preachers. The, the church already has a savior and you're not it. I never will forget that. Humbles up quick, right? And, and his point was, we all of us are servants. We're all Christians that sin. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. All right, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here's the wonderful thing. John shows in the very first part of chapter 2, look, I, I wish that we wouldn't. I wish that you wouldn't sin, but guess what? We have an advocate with the Father. You know what he's saying here? Our lawyer is the judge's son. How does that make you feel? The one that says on the day of judgment, he or she is one of mine. He or she's one of mine. Called alongside of us. Now here, he's not only the lawyer. Here's the verse I was alluding to. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice, propitiation, that weird word there. The atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only. How much has he paid for? The sins of the whole world. That means salvation is offered to all. Hold on to those truths. All right, number two, we all deserve something. There's something that Daniel deserves because of how heinous, how horrible sin actually is. Now, we, I don't think we could take the consummate of our skills and take a word from a dictionary that would define how ugly sin actually is. It's horrible. And we ought to see it, not as with a wave of the hand, well, it's just sin, sin every day. We see it everywhere. We need to see it in all capital letters, right? Because of what it did. I want you to think about this for me. Sin has to be horrible for the blood of Jesus to be shed the way that it was. Sin has to be horrible for the Son of God who allowed himself to be separated from God on our behalf. And folks, sin has to be horrible for a place such as hell to be a reality. That's how ugly sin is. In James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, if you've got your Bibles, look at this for just a second. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Watched a, a talk show a few years ago, and this, this is definitely probably not the only talk show that has housed a conversation like this. They were talking to different people who were living a certain way of life that was foreign to them at one time, but now they live it. And they live it, and, and they're owning it with pride. Not that it's a mistake, but that God made them this way. That God created them that way. Folks, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 paints a different picture. Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God, for God does not tempt anyone. He's not tempted by evil himself. He doesn't tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and he is enticed. Lust comes and conceives this sin, and sin, when it is finished, what's the, what's the end result? It's death. It's death. Folks, that's, that's a very full concept there. It's not just dealing with physical. There's all a lot right, wrapped up into that, what kind of death we're talking about. But did you notice, the King James Version and others do it like this, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. The more accurate rendering is this, and the sin. How many sins? One. The sin, when it is finished, without the work of Christ, where do we stand? We're lost. We don't deserve it. But Jesus, however, took our place in his death on the cross. Now, I'm going to say something this morning. I don't know if you've heard it before, and it's not meant to cause an uproar. I want you to think about it. We have to be careful how we preach the cross of Christ. We need to preach it the way the Bible actually does, not as an angry pagan God that's so mad at us he wants to put the smack down on his own son. 
And I'm afraid sometimes the way we have portrayed the cross, we should read John 3, 16 like this. For God so hated the world that he killed his only son. Sad to say that's how some see the situation of God offering his son Jesus. But if you go back to the Old Testament, I want you to ask yourself this. What was the blood of sacrifice for? Was it to appease wrath? That's not what we see in Hebrews 9, the New Testament, talking about it. Verses 12 through 24, it shows that. Guess what they did with the blood? They took the hyssop, the blood of the lamb, and they sprinkled it on everything used in the showroom. Every instrument. Then on the people. You know what it was, was shed for? To prepare them for service. Think about that. To cleanse them and have vessels that are cleansed ready to serve God. That is one of the main reasons Jesus died is so that we could be presented as these clean vessels to God, to serve. That's why we are once called again royal priesthood, kings and priests, right? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Jesus' death is something that we need to see. Sometime we'll do, we'll do a sermon on this, looking at the ancient world and how they saw the cross looking at the worst, that the darkness that we don't see with the physical eye. You want to see the worst and most evil thing it can do to try to assault God's kingdom? Jesus takes it all on himself. He takes all of it. Not a little bit of it. He draws it all on himself as he goes to the cross and he accomplishes God's will so that salvation can be offered to everyone. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, if you're questioning, wait a minute, I, Daniel, I still sin. I, I mess up on a regular basis. I'm trying to live a life for, for Jesus, but I, I, I still sin all the time. Join the club. Folks, there is not a day that I have lived on this earth after coming to a certain age where I understood right from wrong, of course, where I made it through the day and I thought, you know what? <laughs> That's pretty good. 24 hours, I didn't have to pray for forgiveness. That never happens. We all of us sin. We all of us miss the mark daily. This is why the blood has to constantly cleanse those who are not walking in darkness anymore, mind you. They're not living a way of life of darkness. Now they're walking in the light. Therein lies the difference. A faithful walk, not a perfect one. A faithful walk as we keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, last week and a week before, we talked about this one, the concept of spiritual death. When Jesus expresses from the cross in Matthew 27 and verse 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a separation that he endured in a six-hour period, the hell that everyone deserves. He took it on himself and dealt with it. Number three. Our salvation offered to us in and through Jesus is not something we deserve. It's not something we merit. And Daniel had to really allow God to deal with that in him. I kept even after becoming a Christian that it's, it's kind of up to me. I, I've got to, it's all up to me now. I've got to work. I can do this. I can do that. But I keep messing up. I keep messing up. And you know where I found my thinking at in Scripture? Thinking that way? Romans chapter 7. All right. Romans said, I was there. The very thing, the way Paul describes his life, he goes, okay, uh, well, I don't do the things that I should do. And then I do the things I'm not supposed to do. And the things I want to do, I don't. I do that instead of doing the right thing. I'm miserable in this. It's hopeless. Who will deliver me from this wretched state? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Folks, and that's the very, watch what he says at the very beginning of chapter 8. Look at that. It's, the first word is therefore, if you got the King James. Therefore, what's it there for? Y'all heard that before. What's it there for from what we read going up to it? There's this feeling of I'm condemned. I'm, it's, it's pointless. It's hopeless. Who's going to help me? Somebody's got to deliver me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus, none. 
None. Now, Romans 8 clearly shows, as you read further, we walk by a different way of life. We're looking at someone to know how to walk. I look a lot of times at my fellow Christians. The Bible talks about the importance of that on how to walk certain ways and live a faithful life. I look at my brothers and sisters, but before I look at them, who do you think I look at first? Jesus. He provides the model. Not that we're going to earn or merit, but this is, look, don't see this as I have to. This is God's grace being extended to show you this is what you were made for. You're, you're, you're being brought back to it, redeemed, coming back to it. Jesus is constantly through the Spirit bringing us back there. Romans 6, 23. I want you to really chew on that because we, we quote it a lot. It comes up a lot. But do we truly believe what the passage is teaching? Those of us who sing blessed assurance, right? I, I, I've been around churches that didn't really trust in that, and it was a whole hum service with blessed assurance singing, and it just kind of we're just kind of finishing the verses. But Romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin, wages, wages is something you earn. Wages is something you merit. I will never be able to stand before God in and of myself and go, God, you owe Daniel Hayes. Whoa. He owes us nothing. He gave the very best, though. Even though he owes nothing. The wages of sin is death. But what you can earn is the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? Earn and gift, they don't go together. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's a done deal. And even though we don't believe it, I, I've, I'm sad to say, folks, some churches have become so guilty of teaching so much about the pot and possibility of apostasy. Yes, you can fall away. The Bible shows you can fall away. It's like they camp out on it and they want everybody to focus on it. You can, you could, you could lose it. Now watch out. Rather than seeing this through the work of Christ, the probability of being lost is very small. In other words, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to step away from Jesus in a life with him. If you want to be a person who's worried about your salvation, you must have no relationship with Jesus anymore. You must be done with it. If you're someone who is still praying, still loving, still studying, still spending time with the church, which is essential, there's no such thing as being a spiritual person, and I don't need any kind of church. The Bible says, yeah, you do. We all do. We need one another. We need the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, Verse 10, have you ever met somebody who is self-righteous? Don't, don't have to raise your hand or anything. But seriously, think about it. Have you met someone that is self-righteous, that they are the standard for people? And when they impart something, it's from them, so it's ultimately wise and right. You need to really listen to what that person says. They are beyond good. They're at another level. You know that was going on in Jesus' day and time? Hold Romans 3. Go to Luke chapter 18. Folks, this is a scary place to be as a self-righteous person. Does Jesus know what's going on in our heart? Yep. He does at all times. Now, the Pharisees, the scribes, not all of them, but some of them had really done a good job at pulling the wool over people's eyes and somehow convincing them they were the holy ones. They're the ones, they're the standard. If you want to be holy, you look at us. Romans 18, 9, Jesus states it outright. If you wonder, did Jesus know that about them? Yes. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who knew no sin. He made him sin on our behalf, not make him commit a sin. He took the sin on him that we might be made the righteousness of God 
in him. Who's my righteousness? Jesus, my Savior. I'm so thankful that this is the way God sees things. It's what his word teaches us. The more we come to understand the truths of God, more and more we don't arrive. That used to be one of the most dangerous frames of thinking. Do you, do you realize the most divisive spirit in the church, the more I've done research on it, you know what I believe it is? Unlearnable. Someone being unteachable and unlearnable, it creates a lot of division. I've been in places where if that exists, you start teaching something they've never heard before, they're offended because since they've never heard it, no, that can't be right. Little cliques form and we're no longer growing together. This ha Let me tell you, every place Satan is working hard to get us off track, to ruin us. Folks, I'm going to tell you this. The more we come to study and know the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God through Jesus, the more zealously you will want to show it to others. You will want to live showing that, extending to others what's been extended to you. That should be the case. Looking for the best in people. Being a person who wants to build brothers and sisters up rather than tear them down. I got a question for you. Are you a fire truck or a fuel truck? Which one are you? Somebody's fire is going. Are you the fire truck that comes along and into that? Or are you the fuel truck that comes along and, and takes that fire to another level for somebody? The membership of the body of Christ. We've been talking being connected in Christ. Folks, it's not something we earn. It is a wonderful privilege. We are not added to membership by paying our dues. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41, in that section, this is where Peter has let these people know, you have crucified in the most painful, shameful way. You have killed your Messiah. You've crucified him. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus who you have crucified with wicked hands, both Lord and Christ. And they're pricked. If you're going to be genuine, honest, and pay attention to what he's saying, it didn't mean only 3,000 of the 100 plus thousand were the ones to, to respond and come through with this. But after he says this, they're pricked to the heart, and they ask, men and brethren, Peter, what are we going to do about this? And then the verse that we know well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and unto all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, Peter exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And that same day there joined 3,000 souls. Is that what it says? They're added. Who added them? God. God added them, not us. God added, and when God adds us to his saved through the work of his son, folks, the more we understand and see that, the more we understand how sure our salvation is. I look on my life. I look back at a few years ago. East Tennessee School of Preaching. I was such an anxious mess because I had this view that I didn't know, am I really saved? Am I really saved? I mean, I've been baptized, I could cross this off. Brother Edwin S. Jones, one of my favorite teachers, I don't know that he will ever know how much this statement changed my life. He took me out of the classroom. I hadn't disrupted the classroom, he just took me out. Took me out of the classroom, took me into the big auditorium at Carnes Church of Christ, sat with me on the front pew, and I was like, well, I guess we're responding here. What's going on? And he tells me, he pats me on the leg, looking straight ahead, not looking at me. And then as soon as he says this, he leaves. Daniel, buddy, the only time you are going to have peace is when you know that Jesus knows you will never get it right. And he walked out after that. 
In no way was he saying, just do whatever you want to do. He wanted me to come to grips with this fact. My salvation is completely dependent upon the work of God through his son. My way of life is imperfect. First John shows that I'm still completely dependent while walking in the light. His blood is cleansing. We must be a people who are willing not only to show this to one another, but to others around us that we believe we are sinners saved by grace. They need to see this. They need to see they're not coming to a glorified country club, a specific, specific club for those who are already spiritually fit. All right. I want to tell you, I used to work at a gym years ago, and I used to watch this happen, and it would break my heart. Working there as a personal trainer, and people would walk in that were muscled up. I mean, they're flexing in the mirrors, and I mean, they're showing off and whatnot. And lo and behold, somebody comes in that you know they've seriously come not to show off. They want to get in better shape. And when they came into that environment, they wouldn't even look at anybody. They would kind of float back here very quietly, I don't want anybody to see me, back here to the locker. I lived a Christian life that caused people to do that at one time. To know uh, that guy, he's probably judging me. Came on back, I'm going to tell you, this is one of the most friendly on-fire congregations I've ever had the privilege of serving, ever. God is doing mighty things through you. He's going to do more mighty things as we go forward into his future and we put our trust fully in him. But mark my words, one of the things the devil will try to do is destroy it, to knock it all down. We must be a humble people that are completely dependent on Jesus that when people look at us, they see him. They see the love of Christ. They see the grace of God. It's a blessing to be members of God's kingdom. It's wonderful. Today, I wonder if you've asked this since I've come here before. You know, this guy pushes this quite a bit in his sermons, right? Talking about baptism. Well, there's a reason I do it, and not for the reason maybe you think. I don't just see baptism where here's a technicality that needs to be influenced at the same amount as all these other things. No, this is a particular moment God, not Daniel, God has chosen God has chosen this. This means of water and going down in water, having our sins wiped away by the blood of Christ, and we become members of his household. We become members of his kingdom. If we realize that when we go down in these waters, it's not the water. It's the blood of Jesus we see through the eyes of faith. The Bible says this is what happens. The blood purchases us, cleanses us, and adds us to the saved at that moment. Now, all these others we focus on are very important. We want to believe and continually show that we believe. We want to live a life of continued repentance because we never arrive at perfection. We want to live as a people who show we prize and love God's word. But that wonderful new journey doesn't start until a new birth happens. And once it takes place, you're added to the very thing the Ephesians are part of, the household of God Members of a family who share in the grace of God, his love, his mercy regularly. If you've not yet made that decision, don't know why not. We want you to do that. God wants you to do that more than we have the ability to fathom and understand. Once you come as together we stand and as we sing.